The agenda for today that ties back to this webinar is managing healthcare risk. And we're going to talk about four broad categories. Um, the first we're going to, thing we're going to talk about is predictive modeling. And this is a different way of looking at, at the same problem. And that same problem is understanding cost and figuring out what you can do about it. Um, the next topic we're going to talk about is population health status. Um, it, it's tough to manage what you can't measure or understand, and we'll discuss some industry-leading ways to do so in that segment. The next section we're going to talk about is provider quality. Um, employers are often overlooked as the real purchasers of healthcare, yet seldom they assert their position in this. Large companies like Disney, Intel, and Boeing have all made this realization over the past few years, and they've begun negotiating directly with providers. And to do that, you have to understand um, how providers operate, and you have to be able to measure quality and performance. Um, not every employer has the skill to do this, but tools that you'll see are available to help you begin to look at the data and to move in the same direction they are. And the last topic we'll discuss is data surveillance, which is the Sentinel. Um, we're going to show you how we can watch for events that explain changes and or can present an opportunity to avert even higher potential costs. The first section we're going to talk about in predictive modeling is moving from the wind, rear view to the windshield. This is a shift in perspective that we're going to talk about. Historically, um, traditionally that is, the industry is focused, and rightly so, on historical data. This is on what's happened to cost trends. Um, and that's important to understand where things are headed from, from a, uh, a renewal perspective, from a, a budget increase perspective. But really to, to get ahead of, of the cost curve and to manage risk and cost, you really need to start looking through the windshield at what's coming ahead. And uh, this section we're going to talk about how we can do that. <coughs> In order to set the stage for that, the first thing I want to talk about is the Pareto Principle, otherwise known as the 80-20 rule. I'm sure everybody on the call has heard this many times in, in some form or fashion, so it's no surprise that 80% of any employer's health care cost is driven by 20% of the population. So just a quick example, if, if there's a thousand lives, a thousand members on a plan, 200 of them are driving 80% of the cost. Just park that in, your, in the back of your mind as I move on to the next slide, um, which is a little bit even more profound in that within the 20% who consume 80% of the total cost, believe it or not, 1% of a population consumes a quarter at least of all costs. For some employers, this goes up to 30 to 35%, and 5% of the population is responsible for at least half of total cost. This is, this is meaningful because what it does is it takes health care, which we typically look at as a large number problem. It's sometimes number three or number four on an employer's P&L, and it gives a slightly different perspective that it really, when you look at it, is a small number of problems because it's a relatively few number of people that drive the majority of cost. Example, that that same 1,000 life employer, um, if they've got a spend of $5 million over the course of a year, 10 members are responsible for $1.2 million. The other interesting step, statistic that we see happen over and over is when you look at the top 5% of claimants that drive half of total cost in any given year, half of those people who are joining that club that year, they weren't high flyers the year before which means there's turnover. What turnover means is that 
when one large claimant goes away, there's another one ready to take their place. With this in mind, knowing that relatively few people drive a majority of cost and that there's high turnover year over year, I'd like to take a minute and talk about the current state of the industry and what tools and what resources are available today to help employers manage costs. There are three broad categories that carriers and TPAs all leverage um, on employers' behalf. And it falls into the general description of medical management. And these three things are utilization management, case management, and disease management. Utilization management is, is simply, it's kind of like a, a guard for the health plan. Um, every health plan has a summary plan description and it governs what services are included, what aren't, what services need preauthorization. Um, there are some things that uh, you want to put some controls around. Otherwise, um, everybody will want to take advantage of, a, of an elective service, for example, that may not be medically necessary. So what utilization management is, is it's a process where certain procedures have to go through a review and, a, and an approval process uh, before the provider can, can perform service. It's, it's a really good frontline way of controlling cost. The next section, case management, that's another uh, very important aspect of a health plan and managing cost. Case management, though, usually target, targets the top 1% of claimants. These are the catastrophics. These are individuals who, uh, by and large, you know, have cancer, uh, premature birth that are, that are high cost, just really, really tough diagnoses. And what case management usually does is it, um, it reacts to a few different things. It reacts to a utilization management request. So somebody is going to become impatient or is requesting to be covered for an inpatient stay. That's a flag or a trigger to go over to case management. Um, another one is if a claimant exceeds a certain threshold, like $20,000 or $25,000 in cost. Um, another trigger to get into case management is a, uh, a really, really bad diagnosis. These are all things that, that um, the carriers watch out for. And when somebody gets on their radar, um, they'll call them up, try to reach out to them, establish a connection with the patient, and make sure the patient um, understands their transition of care, understands certain aspects about what's going to happen to them. But like I said, it's usually targeting the top 1% of claimants, not necessarily the top 5% of claimants. And the last section is disease management. Disease management is more geared towards self-help. Um, you know, a good example of disease management is someone might go in and be a recently diagnosed diabetic, and um, as a result of being a re recently diagnosed diabetic, they might get some information in the mail from a carrier or, or a health company um, explaining to them self-help protocols, explaining to them things that they might do to take care of themselves. Disease management um, is getting better uh, than it has been. I've seen disease management regimens be more targeted than they have in the past, but by and large, it's not terribly effective at being proactive. In fact, all of these strategies, the, the one thing that they have in common, besides being medical management strategies to control cost, obviously, is they are all reactive. And in many ways, the cost or the risk has already been incurred, has already materialized, or is about to be incurred. And this is where we have an opportunity to shift the view to the windshield and take a more proactive stance. Again, understanding that a relatively few number of people drive the majority of healthcare costs, and that in any 12-month arbitrary period, over half of the top 5% of claimants are new to that category, meaning they weren't in the top 5% of claimants the year before. Is there any way to look at a population and predict who has the capacity to become a top five percenter, but hasn't yet, but could? The, the answer to this is yes, and this is the windshield view, and that's the topic of the next section. Our, our goal is to show you some strategies and some tactics to shift perspective from solely being focused on the past and focused on what's coming down the pipe. The goal of this next section 
is simple. What we want to do is use these tools to either avert, mitigate, or manage the next high cost encounter. Um, you know, as I, as I go through this, this presentation, this material, there's a, there are some frequent questions that run through uh, people's minds when they're listening. And these are some questions that might be running through your mind. Um, one is, how is this process different than other strategies that are in place? Um, how are people identified? Uh, what is the basis for identification? And, and the most important one is, now that we know who these folks are, not you specifically, the employer, but somebody knows who they are, what do you do with them? What, what, what can you do um, uh, to, to manage them to, to lower, lower cost and better outcomes? Um, I'm not going to address these right this second, but my hope is that as we go into the next section, these, some of these answers will become Clearer. Yeah, and I think you know one of the things uh, as through this presentation, uh, I know we have employers uh, and groups on the phone that are all different sizes. Uh, some of you are currently self-funded, some of you are fully insured, and some of you are fully insured and contemplating moving to a self-funded chassis. You know what I would have you think about, regardless of what bucket you're in, uh, even if you're in the fully insured. A marketplace and not really looking at self-funding right now, some of the concepts that Case is going to talk about, some of the ideas are things that you need to be aware of that uh, if you're working with the partners group, these are things that we want to have conversations with the carriers on because they do have access to the data. We're working with them and as Case mentioned, we are starting to see carriers move from, you know, for example, disease management and diabetic more to a whole person aspect and looking at everything that is impacting that per person, it's not only diabetes, there's probably multiple chronic conditions that they're dealing with, there may be behavioral health issues, there may be other obstacles in the way to get that person to a healthier state of mind and a state of being. And so these are the conversations, whether insured, self-funded, or moving towards self-funded, that I think are important for you to start to think about. And as we progress and as healthcare uh, evolves and changes, these are going to be critical things that you're going to want to be thinking about all or in part, what can we do for our own population? Yeah, great great point, Gary. And, and that, that reminds me of something I meant to say earlier, which was um, even if you're a, an experience rated uh, 200 employee fully insured group or you're a 2,000 large self-funded group, those ratios I described earlier, the 80-20 rule, the 5% driving half of cost, the 1% driving at, at least 25% of the total cost, those ratios hold true. Um, to groups that are, that are big and groups that are relatively small. The, the smaller you go, though, the, the more likely um, they are to be even more skewed towards 1% of the population driving as much as half of claims. So that's, it, it's, uh, it's relevant um, to groups of all sizes. With that, I'm going to transition to the next section um, of, 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 the, of the presentation, talking about population health. And before I do that, I'd like to introduce a, a, this concept that you're going to see throughout the next number of slides uh, called Interis. Interis is a, is a um, analytics brand wrapper that, that was created by the partners group and it really encapsulates the, the financial data analytical discipline that we've developed and we have here at the partners group. Our process, as you see in, in the graphic, is um, we've got a, a skill set and a capability around data collection and data management. I myself am a uh, am part finance, part uh, data analyst, part data architect, part um, uh, healthcare, consultant. healthcare consultant, exactly. So um, being able to manage, organize, and interrogate data is, is really important in making it useful. And, and building strategies and helping to make decisions with it. And that's what Interis is. Um, Interis, we, we have partnered with VeraRisk. We recently, as recently as last year, uh, we utilized Hopkins ACG as our predictive clinical engine, um, which is a great, it's a great model. And I've got some slides in the back here that will compare and contrast a little bit ACG, which is VeraRisk's predictive uh, score methodology versus Hopkins ACG. Uh, but we transitioned to Verisk because Verisk has, uh, has some additional features 
that we think are useful, not just to us, but to any employer who wants to, to uh, go down this journey and, and understand their, their health status and understand what they can do about it. Um, within the various suite of services that we have access to, we've got four, well, three broad, um, broad applications. The first is medical intelligence. And medical intelligence is, is more employer focused and it has a, um, a large suite of, of views and reports and the ability to not just measure financials, how they've trended, um, and not just measure um, how, um, what, what's driving claims, but also to peer into the risk factors, the forward looking risk factors that we'll get into of where your population is headed. Provider intelligence is a section that speaks to uh, the, the provider community. Very few groups that we work with have HMOs. Very few of them have a, uh, designated PCPs that is a gatekeeper. Uh, most of the groups we deal with in the Northwest and in the West Coast are, um, are um, fee-for-service they are PPO plans. As such, members can see uh, various docs, whoever is in network. And one of the features that we have the ability to do with Verisk is we have the ability to invoke a PCP attribution model. And what that does is it takes the population, it looks at patterns of utilization, and it assesses which doc or physician that the member is seeing is more likely than not their primary care physician. That's powerful because we can then assign that member to that doctor and then look at the doctors and ask the question, who is seeing a majority of your patients and how are they managing those patients? Um, enterprise intelligence is another section which is um, it, it, it's a dashboarding tool and it allows us to create flexible interactive dashboards on your behalf uh, for groups that are large enough. We can also extend access to that to you. Going through uh, what Interest is, Power by Veris, these are some slides. I'm going to move through the, these quickly because I've described it pretty well. But what I want to say is that one of the aspects to our partnership with Veris is that we are um, we are not simply a reseller of the service, we are a primary aggregator of data. Meaning that all of the data that we get for our clients goes, goes through us. We have the obligation to map and transform and translate that data into meaningful ways that as the data goes into the application, it's used. Often we see employers, large employers and small employers, they are attracted by the glitz and the sizzle of a tool, and they think a tool will solve their problems. And tools are great, um, but if the data doesn't go in there in a way that's meaningful to the employer or to the benefit consultant who needs to use it, then it's kind of like a, um, a Bowflex or, or a workout machine. <laughs> that people like these things, they buy them more often than not, they sit in the garage and, and don't get used. Um, and I, it, it, it's, it's tragic when tools sophisticated tools get, get put into practice, but they don't get used. And as the primary aggregator of the data, we have the ability to translate the data and transform it in, in a meaningful way. Not only that, we are also a competent and expert wielder of the tool for delivering the highest value. So we use it when we're consulting with clients, and we have the ability to assist clients get the most out of the tool. Last, a little bit about in Terrace is we are not wedded to one solution or one tool. Uh, we have the ability to fill gaps that aren't covered. No, no system is perfect. There are always things that come up that uh, employers need to look at. And our ability within Terrace and Verisk allows us to not just leverage what Verisk has to offer, but, but fill gaps. Going back to what we have to offer through Interis with Verisk is, um, 
sorry. This is the slide I was looking for. Um, these are some common insight opportunities that employers should be looking at. One question is population answers. So understanding what is the health status of the population, the prevalence of key conditions, understanding the risk and the cost associated with those conditions and those members who have those conditions is one aspect of the insight that we can provide. Another aspect are quality answers. So uh, Verisk has, we have over 200 quality risk measures that we can look at. We would not recommend anybody staring to all of them. They would probably go cross-eyed. But with over 200 quality risk measures, what we can do is focus on things like ketis cancer screenings, uh, cervical, breast, colorectal cancer, and put tools and insights in the employer's hands to figure out where those, where they sit with those screening stats. And if they have a desire to improve them, we can monitor and measure and put strategy in place to improve them. Same thing with diabetics, same thing with hypertensive people. Um, there are so many opportunities to look at risk measures and for the employer to take um, an appropriate but more active role in encouraging the population um, to, to, to pursue uh, higher levels of health awareness and accountability. Opportunity to answers. Uh, as we stated before, the, the three main solutions or, or aspects that the, the industry has, has to bear, and when I say industry, I mean carriers and TPAs, around managing healthcare costs and risk is utilization management, case management, and disease management. Every self-funded contract and most fully insured groups that are experience rated or not, there is a cost burden. Sometimes it's explicit, it's broken out to the PEPM or PMPM. Sometimes it's buried into a retention figure. But there is a cost burden of medical management in every single, that every single employer is paying. One of the things that we can do in Interest is we can perform what we call a medical management audit. And what this allows us to do is look at your data, look at your population, gain some insights, compare it to who the carrier or the TPA is, is really going after and trying to manage and mitigate. And we can do is compare and contrast that and see what kind of value is the carrier or the TPA providing. There are some that are really good at this. And we find that, by and large, the care of TPA is doing a great job at, at being a steward and, and managing that risk. And, and some of them don't do so well. And so we can perform medical management audit to uh, hold the carriers accountable. We also can produce some uh, proprietary dashboards that give you insight into opportunities. One of those dashboards that we may or may not have an opportunity to get in towards the end of this, this session is, um, is uh, an ER dashboard that we put together that we look at avoidable. ER encounters and focus on where they're happening and possibly if that rises to a level of being a significant portion of the ER spend, put some strategies in place to, to control that. And last is cost answers, discovering the key drivers of healthcare costs, past, present, and future. With cost, you know, the, the concept of the top 5% of claimants really um, infiltrates and it affects everything that, that I every way that I look at healthcare costs. The reason being is because the top 5% of claimants, um, it really impacts every category. So carriers and TPAs are great at producing reports that show what is your inpatient spend, what is your outpatient spend, um, how much cost has happened here, how much cost has happened there, um, how much cost is in the musculoskeletal category. And these are all great, great concepts and great things to look at. But what they seldom tell you, the insight you don't get, is that the top 5% of claimants often skew those categories. So if, for example, 20% of a group's claims is in the musculoskeletal category, chances are that 60% of that category is, is a very few number of individuals driving it. And it, it really is a, is a different way of looking at the data, past, present, and future, that when you consider the top 5% of claimants and the impact it has, it helps you make decisions um, and it helps you realize where you need to focus your resources. We've got trending and rising risk for cost answers as well. Um, with that, I'm going to talk about the business challenges and 
as I as I look at this slide and I look at Verisk and what, and what we we're doing within Terrace, um, it's not lost on me that there are these tools that health plans have long had access to, and Verisk is one of them. And as I said before, as employers realize that they are should be if they're not that they are the major purchasers of healthcare. Um, there's no reason why they can't pursue and have access to the same tool the health plans have. Now again, this is appropriate access. We, we don't want anybody to have PHS they shouldn't have and we can control that. Uh, but by and large, um, the tools that we're going to discuss and the strategies we're going to discuss are available and they're utilized right now by health plans. Um, providers are using them and employers more and more are using them. I'm going to um, pass over this slide for the sake of time because I want to get to some of the science behind the predictive modeling and the population health views that we can produce. Um, what I've got before you is a process. It, it's, it's a data flow. So one of the questions earlier is how are people identified? What is the basis for doing predictive modeling and moving to the windshield view? You know, if we re-ask the question, can, is there a way to look at a population not just understand who has driven a majority of costs in the past, but assess are there people in the population that have a high likelihood of being a high cost claimant going forward? How is that done? This is a great slide that talks about the process and the data points that go into that. On the left hand, um, the, the data coming into the process is we rely um, primarily on post adjudicated claim data. That's, that's data that comes from an uh, a TPA or a carrier. Uh, we look at medical encounter data. We look at RX um, claim data. We get eligibility data. That gives us a demographic view. Um, we look at lab biometrics um, and HRA data. All that goes into a process where we normalize it, we transform it, we translate it so that it's meaningful. We then pipe it over into Verisk. They put it through their process. Um, they extend and enhance it through their DXCG, which I'll, I'll define that in a minute. Um, that, that's their, their relative risk scoring model. They also have all sorts of uh, diagnosis grouper, procedure groupers that allow us to really do some really cool things in the far right, which is population health management, reporting benchmarking, performance management, medical management. We've, we've discussed those at length. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the far right hand side. The, um, the next slide, really, I want to talk about the the modeling aspect, DXCG, because that's key. Yeah. To, to move to the windshield view, you have to have a basis for looking at the population and understanding, well, um, is it just age and gender? That's a good start. Age and gender is useful, and you can tell a lot by that. But more importantly, um, what's ailing the individual is key to understanding what is likely to happen on a go-forward basis in terms of resource utilization. One of, one of my main criticisms of, of, of the industry is it tends to focus disease category, on disease categories. So a lot of DM disease management regimens, what they do is they, they say, we need to target your diabetics. We need to target your hypertensives. We need to target your asthmatics. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you look at the top 5% of claimants in any given year, what you'll find is those that have multiple chronic conditions are most at risk for blowing up in terms of cost. And it's not just one thing. Having di diabetes is not great in terms of cost and utilization going forward, but it really is when you've got gender in the mix, you've got a certain person over a certain age, you've got multiple chronic conditions. You know, one thing that I see over and over again is if you look at any diabetic population, two-thirds of them at least, sometimes three-quarters, are also hypertensive and have high cholesterol or being treated for that. So in looking at the health of a population, it's not good enough to just look at disease categories in order to predict what's going to happen. You have to look at all the things that are ailing a person along with their age, along with their gender. And if I could get more information, I would love to have it. I can't get it. But some things that I don't have that I would love to have is um, where do they shop? What kind of food do they eat? And we get some of that from HRA. But that's beside the point. Going back to this slide, um, what, what DXCG does is it looks at these things that I'm talking about and it weights them, it groups them, um, it, it looks at um, the age, the, the diseases that the, that the person has, 
And what it does is it, it takes all this information and it compares it to a 45 million member database, normalized database for commercial, uh, for non-elderly. And it, it can produce a number of risk models. And some of those risk models are, is from a, from a backward looking perspective. It says, based on the makeup of this person, this is what they should have cost. And so we can look at that and say, well, what should, what should they have cost and what, they did, what did they cost? That helps us do things like evaluate the efficacy of medical management. Another thing that we can do is it takes the information and it looks forward. And it says, based on the demographics, based on what's alienating the individual, what is likely to happen in the next 12 to 18 months. And that's really the windshield view we were talking about. And in this case, this is John. He's a 50-year-old male. Um, and the relative risk score prospective for this individual is 4.9. What that means is they are 490 times more, more risky than the average person. A risk score of one means you're just like everybody else. A risk score lower than one means that you're actually less risky, and a risk score greater than one is you're more risky. The higher the number, the more risk there is. The one thing that I wanted to talk about that wasn't in the last slide, but in this slide, is in addition to understanding the illness burden and have that represented by DXCG, which is Verisk's risk scoring methodology, is I mentioned earlier there are over 200 quality risk measures that Verisk has access to and that they've developed, and they're always developing more. Within those quality risk measures, um, this, what we can do is we can look at an individual like the 50-year-old 50 50 year male earlier and ask the question, is that person of age and gender and, and qualified as somebody who should get a colorectal cancer screen, yes or no? If he's hypertensive, um, is he doing following evidence-based protocols, medical protocols or standards of care for things that, should, that he should do, like getting certain, um, certain procedures done every so often. Diabetic, a great example is getting an A1C test done every six months, an albumin and urine test that tests for renal failure, among other things. So these are just examples of, of, of quality measures. And what various can do is fold into their risk score what, what they characterize as a care gap index. And the notion here is that, you know, kind of like credit scoring in the financial industry, um, individuals that, that don't pay their bills tend to be higher default risk. Um, in the same fashion, individuals who have lots of care gaps probably are at higher risk for their conditions being unmanaged and therefore a higher risk of a, of a high cost encounter. That gets folded in. And the care gap index is one of, the, one of the various ways we can look and segment the population and target those who might not be high illness burden risk. They may not be um, high cost, but they might be a high care gap risk, and we can develop different strategies for different different groups of people. Um, and here's a, on the right is, is a simple uh, view of how that plays out. Um, on the left-hand side, number one, you can see they're diabetic. Um, they've had their annual A1C test, eye exam, lipid profile, um, had a long off visit, no hospital ER, had this member on the, on the right, um, hasn't been to the doctor. <laughs> Uh, hasn't had a long office visit, maybe was in for some acute, uh, maybe urgent care because that's sore throat. Um, hasn't had an A1C test, so they probably don't know how their pancreas is, is functioning. Um, is seen eight different physicians for various things, sudden vascular claims, so their risk score is higher. And as I said before, uh, Verisk offers several different models, and um, within, within the risk the relative risk score, there is both a concurrent and a prospective view. We also have access to a likelihood of hospitalization, which is another really key aspect. The likelihood of hospitalization index is really important, going back to the fact that the top 1% drive over a quarter of all costs, the top 5% of a population drives over half. Um, you know, one, one averted inpatient stay could, could save at least $100,000, if not more. We can't prevent all of them, but understanding what the risk is, understanding the few people who have the capacity to drive that cost and drive those encounters is important, 
and we have the ability to do it. And this is just part of the science behind it. Next, I would like to talk a little bit about um, some patient patient outcomes. And this is a great slide that, that talks about the segmentation and different paths that we would slot different cohorts or groups of members into based on all of the data and analysis that we can get out of, out of their risks, relative risk scores, CGI, and illness burdens. So here's a great example. ACO population, ACO is a term for accountable care organization. Um, you can think of that as an employer population. Employees, dependents, everybody covered on the planet. And what we would do is on the right, in the middle, you've got um, those little little figurines of people. You've got different different populations, segments of the population represented here. You've got those who are high cost, those who have high care gaps, those who have low care gaps, and those who have low disease burden. And each one, each cohort really looks different and requires a different tact in order to measure and manage them. Um, your high cost folks, in this case, they're looking at 3% uh, of the population. Um, the average cost of the, of the top 3% is about 60K annually. They've got a, a relative risk score of 13. And, uh, and a, a high care gap index, but it's not too high. The next, and, and for these folks, the high costs, um, the goal here is to, um, is to know them um, and, and steer them to, to, to either lower cost providers, more efficient providers, and, and make sure that they, they have the resources to, um, to hopefully get river back to the mean. The next are high care gaps. Um, these are individuals who um, have definitely a high risk score, 4.9 is, is something that we look at, $11,000 per year. Uh, yeah, that's relatively high. You know, what I've seen is the top 5% of claimants is around $20,000 to $25,000 a year. So, this high care gap individual is someone who has not hit the top 5% of claimants yet, but they have a high likelihood of because they have a high care gap index and, and a relatively high disease burden. Um, and those are individuals um, that we have done this with, with some of our hospital clients. We might uh, put together a campaign that asks these individuals just to go see the doc because the care gaps are driven by a lack of data. What a high care gap index means is that is a relatively unengaged individual. Unlike the high cost claimant, they're engaged because they need to be engaged. They're going to the doctor because they're sick. Um, the high care gap people are probably, you can call, call them sick, but they're not really doing what they need to do. So one of the interventions we might recommend for high care gap folks is just go see a PCP. We don't have to tell them anything else. Just incent them to do that. Um, low care gap, high risk. Um, these are folks who are in the, the $9,000 a year range. Um, again, that, that's higher than average, probably. Um, higher risk scores, there's an illness burden, not too high care gap index. Um, these are folks who, um, they're, they're relatively engaged, they're higher risk, and they may not necessitate any specific intervention, any specific ask, ask but we want to just track them and just keep an eye on them and make sure that they're getting the resources uh, have access to resources they need to, to stay in that bucket of low, low care gap index. And then the last is um, low disease burden. And this is a population that is, uh, you know, we, our strategies here is, is not so much clinical as in the top three strategies with low disease burden, which the majority of the population is around um, health awareness and accountability strategies, biometric screenings, health assessments. Um, the, the low disease burden cohort is um, an often overlooked one in populations. Um, the goal is to not ignore them, but understand that they're there and just keep an eye, keep an eye on them. And make sure that they have access, like I said before, to resources to help them not become um, a higher cost claimer. In case, I'll just jump in here. As I'm looking at this slide really quickly, I think uh, for the people on the webinar, you can start to see how through data analytics and healthcare intelligent uh, programs that we can start to identify different groups or cohorts and again their, their risk probability and, and clearly those high care gaps and low care gaps spending you know nine and eleven thousand you know per year that's a big number and ideally we'd want to keep them there or reduce that 
but clearly we don't want them to move into that high cost uh, arena where you're going from you know nine to eleven grand up to sixty grand on average. And, and I really think this is where, uh, and today the conversation is around the data, uh, the intelligence, how to identify individuals. A whole other part of the uh, consulting is the engagement of the members and how do we actually get them to agree up front that if they are identified that they will take action. You know, for that high care gap group, they really do need to have a clinical intervention. You know, a phone call or a, a written document sent to their home, probably not going to close those gaps. We need them to have a clinical intervention with a, uh, a primary care physician, a primary care medical home, an accountable care organization that's not only going to see them, but understand what they're up against and help them close their gaps and have more than just a 12-minute office visit, have that continuation of care. And again, you can do that because it's a manageable group. And so today we're really talking about the analytics and identifying, understanding for the people that are out there. There's also strategies to say, once we've identified these individuals, how do we actually get them to engage, not only making them aware of their situation, but actually engage with the appropriate care at the appropriate time in order to mitigate some of these gaps in care and try and at least keep them in one of these two middle quadrants versus moving up to the high cost. So as you're thinking about this, data is great, but there's another real critical piece. We need to have that member engaged and willing to participate in maintaining or improving their personal health. Yeah, great, great point, Gary. You know, this is, you know, just to reiterate, this is just a means to an end. And, you know, as I was saying before, the, there's this concept around tools that they, people think tools will solve a problem. This is a tool, but you have to apply the tool. And Gary's talking about his, his strategies around applying the tool. You know, would you, I mean, just for, and if for instance, I mean, you're working with an employer group right now who is working on a strategy with a provider community to, to find these people and not just ask them to go have a primary care encounter, but partner with a provider community to create a place for them to do it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it's really identifying them is important, but actually in setting, and what we're using here is value-based plan design to incent the members from a, a pure health plan, plan design, to go see these high-performing providers that are going to help manage their conditions. And it really is, it needs to be a two-way street. We need to be able to identify, the member needs to be willing to be engaged, but then in this situation here, we have a provider group or a system that is actually ready to receive these individuals and understand that they're more than just a, hey, it's the next office visit. They're part of an overall strategy. That's where with these accountable care organizations, high-performing networks, there's a lot of different acronyms that you can add on or different ways to position or call these programs, but it's really having a, a willing employer and a committed employer identifying a committed and willing employee and then that healthcare provider, it's really the three legs to the stool that we need to work in conjunction with each other to make sure that we are managing these people long term. And that's really where we see the marketplace going. Yeah, and where the opportunities are to manage risk yes. on a go-forward basis. You know, one other point that I didn't make earlier, but I meant to make it, is that uh, if you look at the top category of the high-cost individuals, $60,000 a year, that's a lot. Um, if you, most high-cost claimants, not all of them, there are some categories that, like hepatitis C, like uh, HIV, um, and some other autoimmune disorders that don't go away. But by and large, most high-cost claimants in any given year, they will revert to the mean over time. They won't be there. So if you do absolutely nothing, what you'll find is those people who cost you a lot last year won't cost you so much the next year. And they'll, they'll end up reverting to the mean. Uh, and there's somebody there to take their, to take their place, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and all of this, I just want to reiterate, the goal of this, the strategies, everything you're seeing here, the whole conversation, is not just about understanding who cost a lot last, last year, but it's, also, it's about understanding who has the capacity to drive things going forward, and ultimately the, the end is to put strategies in place to avert, mitigate, or manage the next high-cost encounter. You can't get all of them, but if you can get just a few of them, it's well worth the effort.
with that. Um, all right, so this is this is another view of the same slide I had before, where you've got high cost, high care gap, and I, I sort of jumped the gun because I sort of uh, described this slide, even though I didn't know I was describing it at the time. So, so the high cost uh, is case management. The high care gap is disease management, although you know disease management is a broad category. That would be uh, more targeted interventions. Uh, low care gap is monitor compliance rate disease management and wellness management. Uh, your wellness, I don't know about you guys, just the word wellness just seems kind of old and tired. Whenever I think of wellness, I think of a different concept called health awareness and accountability. So to me, that just is more meaningful because you, how, do you me how do you measure and manage wellness? It's like measuring happy. It's hard to do it, but you can, you can measure health awareness by looking at participation in biometric screenings and HRA. So are people aware of their health? Have they, has, what percentage of the population has had a, a primary care encounter in the last year? That's health awareness. And accountability is the care gap index. So, anyways, this is wellness management. I would prefer to call it health awareness and accountability myself, but that's just me. Any comments about that? We'd love to get them when this is done. Uh, the next section I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, opportunities for identification. Uh, I think we touched on a lot of this already. This is saying something um, very similar to what we described before, which is different segments of the population have different needs based on those needs. Uh, organizations, employers to manage that risk need to come up with, with different, different paths for those segments of the population. All right, so I, I said earlier that um, there are various models out there. There, we, for the three years up until uh, the end of last year, we relied on Hopkins Adjusted Clinical Grouper, which is Hopkins ACG is our clinical risk engine, which is a great one. Um, Ingenix has a good one, Impact Pro and Impact Intelligence. Verisk DXCG, these are all, I call them 300 pound gorillas in the space because most organizations are relying on one of these three, sometimes more than one, um, one of these three uh, models in order to not just risk adjust historically, but, but proactively look at uh, upcoming risk. Uh, DXCG is used by uh, health plans, uh, the blue BCBS administration, commercial Medicare ACOs, reinsurance companies. Um, so they're, they're not new to the space. They've been around. They have a lot of channel partners. Um, they're behind the scenes um, for a lot of, of carriers to help them understand risk. Um, with that, I'd like to show you uh, some comparisons that have been done between these different uh, models. And what this is, so R squared, it's not R2, it's R squared. R squared is a, uh, it's a measure that describes the correlative value of, uh, of, of, a, of an index or, or a regression analysis. Generally speaking, the higher the R squared, the better correlated it is. So if you were to ask a question, well, how good is your system for predicting the next set of lottery numbers? Right? But what you would do, is you would do a regression analysis probably of, of what did the model predict the lottery numbers were going to be or the actual lottery numbers. And based on that analysis, it would yield an R squared value. The higher the R squared value, the better the model is at predicting the next set of lottery numbers. The lower the R squared number, the, 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 the worse it is. I've, I've tried this with lottery numbers and you know, I can't get my R squared above like you know, 0.1. Anyways. DXCG, um, their R squared is, uh, is is 20, which is pretty darn good compared to the, the, the other um, the other models in the marketplace. Um, I, I've seen DXCG and ACG go head head to head, and um, they're, they're, there's not a lot that separates them in, in terms of their efficacy. The next thing, uh, MAPE, mean absolute percentage error, is another measure of statistical credibility in the model. And uh, this is just another uh, model that demonstrates the efficacy of DXCG's uh, or Verisk's uh, model uh, predictive capabilities. And uh, I, I like to call this the, it's the, the statistical chops that, that the model has. And I just want to reiterate that these are sophisticated models, sophisticated tools 
that have generally been relegated to be in the hands of sophisticated payers, sophisticated health plans, and those employers who have enough employees and the, the, the capacity to try to wield them in order to manage risk. And the budget. And the budget, exactly. These are, these are historically expensive tools. And uh, within Terrace and with the partners group, we have the ability to extend these sophisticated tools and assist employers use them down at a very reasonable cost, um, and down to employers um, you know, as low as 500 lives, if not lower, if they're self-funded. Now, the next section I'd like to talk about, which is exciting, um, is provider quality. And earlier in, in the uh, presentation, at the agenda level, we talked about uh, the power of understanding provider patterns. Um, and it's really, uh, it's not quite Star Trek where, where no, no employer has gone before, but it's where few have gone. And it's where more are, are ready and willing to go. I was just a week and a half ago, I was talking to a, a, a group in, in the Northeast. It was a, a commercial group. And uh, they were just terribly excited at the thought of being able to look at, at the providers that their members were, were seeing and be able to measure and understand what's going on with those providers and which providers are, are doing well by the employer and which aren't. Um, with, with that, uh, you know, understanding provider practice and provider variability, provider efficiency, it, it, can, be, it can be complicated. Um, and Verif has a lot of different views in this. I am going to try to simplify it for you and focus on the aspects that are most relevant uh, and, and most applicable um, to, to a, a commercial employer population. Um, you know, analyzing outliers, that's good, uh, you know, in terms of looking at providers, seeing which are high cost, which aren't. Um, what you might do with that information is go back to the carrier and inform them <laughs> that, that this is a provider that we think is taking advantage of us. Can you do something? Well, another great opportunity is managing gaps in care. So when we talk about the care gap index and the quality risk measures, um, there are a few different reasons why a member or a patient or an employee may have high care gaps. It could be that the employee just isn't aware. They don't understand that there is a care gap and they just need to be made aware of it and they'll close it. It could be that cost is an issue, like Gary was saying. Um, with that employer he's talking about, putting in value-based benefit design, removing cost barriers is another solution maybe to, to that problem if cost is an issue. Um, another, another issue could be the provider. So there are providers out there that um, they just don't have the conversations with their employers or with their patients around closing care gaps. And if we really want to close care gaps, because we think it's important, studies have shown that uh, closing care gaps has a huge impact on, on future costs going out one, three, five, 10, uh, 15 years. If we really want to close care gaps and, uh, and get, get members, employees, spouses, dependents, and patients uh, to uh, better manage whatever conditions they have, bringing the providers along in that is key. And the first step of doing that is understanding what the providers are doing or not doing. And that's what we have the ability to look at uh, through these tools. Um, you know, for example, this is a, this slide. I'm not going to go through this site specifically, but it talks about some case studies around quality management um, around provider, uh, provider interventions. Um, this is a slide that, I, again, I'm not going to go over a lot of content here. Um, it talks about a program that looked at closing diabetic care gaps, which, which is key, it's important, and it's a great, great, uh, great avenue to managing risk and managing cost. But if you look in this slide when you get to it, and we're going to send this out, right, Gary? Yes, sir. So you guys will have this. Um, but if you look at the bottom, the, 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 you know, basically bringing in the PCPs into the mix is key. Um, our, through enterprise intelligence, we have the ability to look at quality risk measures and find which docs with which regions have the highest gaps. These are high-level views. 
I'm going to get to a slide here that's going to focus in. Um, so this is a great one. Um, this is looking at clinics. And these, these are some views that we have the ability to, to look at and peer into. This is a, a group of, of physicians. Uh, this is a clinic view. talks about how much has gone to that clinic in terms of cost, the allowed PMPM, um, some top COVID stats. And as I go through here, we can actually drill in um, to any provider. So like I talked earlier about PCP attribution, um, what that does is that takes a member and it assigns them to, to, to a provider as their designated or attributed PCP. What you see here on this slide is you see a doctor. In this case, it's Alejandra Viviano. And what you're seeing is are these 499 patients who have been attributed to this doctor. And this is blinded. There's no PHI here uh, because the, the, the individual is uh, identified. But what you can see here is by individual, the entire provider's panel, and what the makeup of it is, um, the number of admissions, the number of ER visits, the highest paid diagnosis. Um, this is the individual view. There are other much uh, more relevant aggregate views, which I will get to in just a second. In case I really think, you know, when you get down to that level, because that's getting pretty nitty gritty, but when you are trying to work with a, a system or a clinic, you know, going back to that conversation about where the, the healthcare world is evolving, that level of detail can really elevate the conversation with that clinic or that individual provider to say, okay, this is where this is the makeup of your your panel, the, the people that you're seeing for this employer, and how are we managing? Is there opportunities uh, to improve the care? And it may, and it's not saying that the the physician is not doing anything wrong. It's simply giving them more detail, more data to better manage their own that you know their own panel of uh, care members. Absolutely. Um, and I've got some higher level views. You're right, that was the nitty gritty. Um, I am going to um, shoot over a little bit um, and show you some other other statistics here um, that we can look at um, to gauge efficacy. Um, I'm looking for a specific slide because I think it's going to speak to what Gary was just talking about um, around provider. Here we go. So this is what I was looking at as a provider comparison. And this has some, some also some really good um, stats. If you can see them, I apologize for the for the small font. But uh, this can be done on a clinic basis, or it can be done on, a, on an individual doctor basis. These are, these are some ways that we would look at the provider community and, and assess those questions that Gary was talking about. We can look at the number of physicians um, in in the group, or the number of patients members that have been attributed to the physician. We can look at the relative risk score. So, you know, one of the things that doctors tend to not like about quality measures is uh, a common refrain is you can't really compare me to that other doctor because my patients are sicker. So, of course, I cost more because my patients need more. Well, that's fine and dandy, and that's true, but how do we know it's true? Relative risk score, case mix adjusting is, is how we know that. So this gives us the ability, that blue box that says risk score, that allows us to look at each doc, look at the attributed patients to the doc, and allows us to really assess, is that panel sicker or not than, than, than another doc? Does the cost that that provider has, is it justified based on illness burden? Um, again, we can look at the care gap index. We talked about that uh, in detail earlier. So for those patients and those members that are seeing that doc or that have been attributed to that doctor, how is their care gap index to have higher or lower care gaps? That's a, that's a great quality measure. And I think, you know, when I look at that, I look at opportunities to work with those different clinics and those providers to help close that those gaps. Uh, and again, it's not, this isn't all, again, on the physician. Uh, a physician or a clinic can can give the best and appropriate advice. Is there follow through with the employee? So it goes back to my analogy of the stool. You need to have a willing employer. You need to have a willing provider that understands this. 
and the member is critical in this conversation as well. But again, the data allows us to get into conversations that can go then deeper with those provider groups. And, and again, the goal is can we improve, can we lower those care gap indexes uh, as much as possible? Because we know when, when people are getting the appropriate preventative care for whatever condition they're dealing with, odds are they are going to be lower cost spenders from a healthcare standpoint. And again, while we're not talking about it today, we also get into the conversation around productivity and absenteeism, all of that feeds together. Yeah. And I just, I don't want people to lose sight that as we're going into these, these uh, you know, going down these rabbit holes in terms of, you know, data and strategy, our, our purpose here in this webinar is to really talk about how to manage risk and manage costs. And so I don't want anybody to lose sight uh, who's listening that um, we started by talking about um, the rearview mirror and the windshield, understanding that a very few number of people drive a majority of costs, that population turns over, then we transition to the population health status and what, what relative risk scores are, what care gap index is, and how to look at a population and how to figure out not just who's cost a lot, but who has the capacity to cost a lot. And that's important to managing risk. We moved on to the provider segment because, as Gary was saying, the three-legged stool, um, the providers are key. An employer can only do so much to manage risk on their own. A health plan can only do so much to, ma so much to manage risk on their own. Um, looking, at least understanding what's going on with providers, being able to look at these views, being able to do PCP attribution, being able to examine the patients that are seeing these docs and look at things like ER efficient ER utilization efficiency, advanced imaging utilization efficiency. What does that mean? Advanced imaging utilization, well, that, it'd be interesting to know if, if uh, a certain doctor likes to scan a lot of patients, whether it's good or not. How do you know if it's right or justified? Well, we can look at the advanced imaging utilization efficiency index and see if there's a doctor who likes to do a lot of high cost imaging. Uh, we, we work with a lot of, a lot of medical systems, and uh, one of the doctors that we, we work with is a medical director. She, she's a physician, and, and I was in a meeting with her a few months ago, and, and this was her perspective. Doctors are motivated by three things. They're motivated first by doing right by the patient, practicing medicine. They're motivated by money, and they're motivated by peer pressure. With that in mind, um, some docs, have higher priorities in those things. Uh, but in my time when I was at United Healthcare uh, many years ago, um, one of their medical directors told me the very same thing around peer pressure. And what he said is that doc doctors specifically, when you show them how they do compared to other doctors, they pay attention. And if a doctor sees that they are an outlier, if they see that their imaging stats are out of line, then they tend to listen. Anyways. That was a, an aside, but this is, a, this is a, the, the, the provider view of the types of information that we can get to as far as looking at which docs are in which things better or not than others. This next one is, is, a, is a shot from what's called the, uh, I think it's called the Provider Profile Dashboard. And this is just a view um, of, of the provider's panel, percent female, relative risk score, most prevalent disease, most prevalent procedure, care gap index. So I'm going down, you can see how many admins they've had. Um, are, are, are their patients going to the doctor more or going to patient? Again, they tend to be a top 5% or top 1% claimant, which is not good, um, among other stats. So there is, there is more information that we can get and have access to than any one person can consume, any one organization can consume. And as Gary was saying earlier, that uh, having, you know, I'll just say this, data in and of itself is useless unless it is given context and analysis. Once it's given context and analysis, which was what Interis does by acquiring the data, mapping, transforming it, putting it up into VeriRisk, we can then analyze it. We can then um, create strategies to help make decisions. And, and that's, 
that's the end. Um, this is just a means to an end these tools. As I said before, it's more information than one person can absorb. Uh, but don't think if you're on the other end of this, this, this call and watching the screen that our recommendation is to just give you a tool and walk away. Our, we are very much interested in not just providing the tool and the data, but working with employer groups and organizations to let them put it to good use. Uh, these are just more good, good stuff around uh, looking at, at provider cost and utilization history. And as we were saying before, uh, providers are often motivated by what other providers are doing. And the last section of the webinar I want to go over is um, what we call the Sentinel. And the Sentinel is, is, is a uh, it's a product that we've developed that is intended to react to changes in data and notify us and you of things that have happened. We, for most of our groups, 99% of them or so, we get data on a monthly basis. Every month that we get data, we know that something has happened. There's something new in that data set uh, that if you're large and, and self-funded and you you get an invoice from the TPA or the, or, or the ASO carrier and you get that every two weeks, you know that there was a large claimant. Right? You know that something bad happened um, to someone. Um, but you don't know a lot about it at that point. And uh, we wouldn't tell you anything you shouldn't know either. But once we get that data, we can run it through what's called our Sentinel. And our goal is to run the data through a process that, uh, before it goes through any other machinations, is to notify and alert as quickly as possible what's going on uh, with, with that last um, run of claims data. Um, you know, we've, got, we've got business rules set up. We've got a, a, a claimant section. So we want to know is there, are there any new claimants within certain categories that have popped up within different thresholds. We can look at this on a year-over-year -year basis. We can look at, at this for one month versus the prior month. This is great for really understanding cause of change. If you had a good month from a paid claims perspective, you will have uh, a negative percentage change of, of claimants across the entire spectrum. If you had a bad month, you probably got some big bubbles in the, in the, in the upper right-hand quadrant, meaning you had uh, an increase in large claimants over a certain threshold. It's intended to give a bird's eye view of what's going on. We've got a, a claimant set of rules. We've got a set of rules that look at diagnosis. We don't tell you who it is, but we look at anybody who is a new diabetic, new hypertensive, new pregnancy. Um, the goal of this, again, isn't, isn't to create any interventions at this point. We would put the data up in the various and, and, and rely on that and other strategies. The goal is to just to give some insight as far as what's happening with the plan. And to the extent that something comes on our radar, like a new diagnosis for chronic renal failure, a new diagnosis for, like I said, a, a pregnancy. Um, it's it's the benefit consulting job that we have on the benefit consulting side to work with the TPA and make sure they know about it. We hope they do, but it's good to make sure that they do. Um, some other rules that we have in the Sentinel that we built are um, utilization um, rules around procedures. So inpatient admins. This how many new inpatient admins were there in, the, in this claims run, how many ER visits, uh, both positive and negative, as well as cancer screening. And these are just some other views. Oh, here we go. I uh, forgot that this was here. But this talks about, on the left, this is a trend, a month over month trend. And this talks, this shows actually a lot of the rules that we've already developed um, in the Sentinel, looking month by month, um, new heart failure diagnosis, breast cancer screens, various uh, procedures that um, we either want to know about because they're good, like uh, cancer screening and A1C tests, or we want to know about because they might be harbingers of things to come, like uh, ESRG and high-cost injectables. Um, with that, that, and I might, yeah, you know, Gary, I'll just jump in here, and it may be a little bit hard to see on the screen, but I think 
this is really important when we think about just managing a self-funded plan and and trying to get alerts as quickly as possible. Um, actually, Case, can you go back to, sorry. Um, okay, so I, really what we have there, for example, is end-stage renal disease or dialysis services, for example. Getting a notification of that, uh, that then the possibility of making sure that it's going to uh, the right dialysis center, we have the right programs in place, but then I think more importantly, starting the clock ticking for when that person becomes Medicare eligible, making sure that we're tracking that, uh, not only from a claims perspective, but as we negotiate stop loss insurance uh, for future renewals, letting them know the time frame that we have. So again, a lot of different things that are out there uh, that we can work through. So just wanted to give you an example of how behind the scenes those are things that the team can look at, identify, and then it may be a claim right now, but looking to say how can we mitigate that in the future. So, good. Thanks, Gary. Uh, you know, this is, um, I, have to, I want to admit something. This is a very tough format for me personally, this webinar format, because, you know, there are a number of people who are logged on. Hopefully, you've been, you're engaged and you're listening. I would love to be able to, uh, to talk to you and to ask you questions, have you asked questions, and elaborate more on some of this stuff um, that we've talked about. Going back, uh, this is all about managing risk. We, we think it's, it's a creative novel, and it's the right way to manage healthcare risk. Um, not the only way, but we've, we've found it to be effective. And um, I would very much like to continue the conversation with anybody uh, who wants to talk about what we've talked about here today. Uh, before we end, I do have some uh, cool things that what, what I couldn't tell, show you, I couldn't show you the system or demo the system. If anybody wants to see that, um, I'll be glad to uh, schedule a go-to meeting where we can one-on-one, -on -one, I can show you more about the tools that I'm talking about and show you how, how we use them um, real time. But what I want to show you is some of the interactive dashboards we built um, over here. Um, these are some interactive dashboards that we built in Enterprise Intelligence. And these are views, snapshots, um, that we are using with clients that show, that give a view of the population of not just what's happened, what's gone on, but it's giving views of the different um, components uh, that exist in, in the population. Uh, yeah, this is our ER dashboard. Um, and all these are dynamic dashboards. So these are static right now. But the cool thing about enterprise intelligence is I can right click on musculoskeletal up at the top there and I can drill across and I can see what's making up that category. I can, um, I can drill into uh, these categories over here, these admin categories, and see what's driving the surgical admins uh, that, are, that are responsible for majority of the cost. But yeah, oh, go ahead. Kate, and I think this is something that these are updated monthly as we're receiving the, the dat claims data feeds and pharmacy data feeds from the different TPAs and, and ASO carrier vendors. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So for those, for those groups that, um, that have access to the tool, identified, um, de-identified, if, if they're not a health plan, um, we, we, get, we get the data monthly, we, we scrub it, map it, transform it, put it up there, and uh, these are dashboards that employer groups can have access to. If not, we can produce these for them and send them monthly as well. Yeah, and I think it may be a little bit hard to see, but even on this slide right here up at the very top, and this is the condition dashboard that is obviously identified, but you see then when you go over to the right, you have the emergency room dashboard, and then probably even more importantly, avoidable ER. And, you know, that is just data. Oh, here it is right here. To where you can look at, okay, we had these ER visits, and then were they avoidable? And that is a that may be education, that may be uh, plan design. It may be working with, depending on where your people are located, the local healthcare community to see if there is a, a program that they have in place at ER. And this is something we're working on with that one employer that I mentioned earlier, to where they are actually having an ER uh, program where they're diverting certain members from their ER to urgent care. Again, it's good for the community because ER is a limited quantity. It's also good for the member. It's lower cost out of pocket and good for the employer because that's costing less at urgent care 
than at the emergency room. So trying to look at those different things, identifying those opportunities, and then looking for ways to actually implement solutions, it's really, if you don't have this level of data, it's hard to go down the path of we're going to do this because of X, Y, and Z, and how do we really on an informed basis make changes that we believe are going to benefit the member and the plan in the future. Um, you know, for those, just one last one, I just want to show you guys what this looks like. Um, you know, there are probably some groups on the line who may not be self-funded yet, and um, but they may be large enough to where they might be thinking about it. Um, the, the first step to being able to manage healthcare risk and cost is, is controlling it. And um, if you're thinking about having more control, then self-funding might be an option. If self-funding is something you want to think about, give us a call. This is one of the financial analysis that we go through in prepping a group and seeing if the risk reward is there. Not every group who is fully insured is a great candidate for self-funding. Maybe they're going to get a deal. You know, who knows? Who knows what the setup is? Or maybe it's the wrong time. It's the wrong year to go. But this is just an example of of the higher level work that we do before we get into everything we discussed here around the details around managing risk and, and, and uh, at the lowest level, at the highest level is assessing risk. And from a self-funded perspective, we uh, are, have, have no, no issues and, and great experience um, putting together views like this to help, help an employer understand the risk and reward. Yeah, and really what this is doing is it's comparing a mature a self-funded plan to a renewal plan. And I've had groups where we've actually done this for three years in a row before they felt comfortable and before they saw the crossover to where there was enough upside to move to a self-funded environment versus staying in the insured world. Obviously, this is just a pure financial view. There's a lot of other advantages of being self-funded, obviously having all the data and access to everything that just case went through. But again, it is a conversation. There's a lot of groups that we work with that we're running dual renewals. We're looking at the fully insured marketplace, and then we're looking at the self-funded marketplace and walking them down the path of, okay, is it the right time? Does it make sense? Or, you know what, you really have a good deal where you're at. Let's stay in the insured marketplace. Again, we'll look at it again next year. That's a conversation that we have and the, the financial due diligence that we look at uh, when we're walking down the path with some of our employer groups. Yeah, and for those of you that have, that have never seen it, uh, who maybe they aren't current clients, this is what we uh, typically do on the rear view mirror side. So, uh, you know, it's important looking at historical historical actuals, and um, my opinion is we're pretty good at that too. This is a view of our typical experience reporting. Um, this would be the 10,000 foot level, and from here we would we would go down and venture uh, into Veris and start asking questions as needed um, of what's going on with what's driving the, the claims trends. This, this group isn't abnormal, um, it's you know, average. Uh, the last two slides I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we, I said it before, I'll say it again, um, all these tools and these strategies are a means to an end. That end is managing risk, it's having better outcomes and lowering cost. And these are just some strategies that we put in place uh, with everything that we're talking about, with, uh, you know, we, we have a we have worked very closely with some large hospital systems on the West Coast, and these are some results that we've achieved in um, in putting strategies in place to close some care gaps. And the last slide is just a, another view of some commercial groups we have. Now these these are these are hospitals, but these are commercial employers. It's not their, their Medicaid or Medicare population. And really, I think the thing that, I, you know, I like about this slide, and, and you know, it, it talks about engaging their members. Do we start with employees? Do we work with employees and spouses? But I, I think the thing that I'd have you take away from this slide is that this isn't just a, uh, a one-year program. This is typically when employers are self-funded and you are on the risk for your claims, walking down the path to say, this is a strategy. We're not going to be able to do it all in one year, but as we go down, we are going to continue to grow. 
and expand the programs. And as the data comes in and we get more and more of a feel, targeting those different cohorts, expanding the spouses. There's a lot of different steps. Uh, but again, I would keep in mind the crawl, walk, run strategy, where look at it over a three to five year period versus we're going to do everything in year one and inundate HR, inundate our employees. And uh, really, a lot of times, if you go too fast, uh, that can be problematic for adoption. So that's, again, part of the conversation we have. What is our strategy? What does the next three years look like? What are our goals? And then we work towards those. So again, I thought it was real important to show you this, uh, that it is more than just a one-year uh, type of program. All right. All right. Well, that's about all I've got. And uh, I apologize if um, we put you to sleep or, or made you go cross-eyed in, in all the details we're discussing. Uh, but as I said before, this is um, it's a format that uh, is, is great for talking to a lot of people at once, but it really lacks the ability to interact with everybody. And if there are any, any questions out there or if you'd like to have uh, a deeper conversation or even a demo of what we can do for you, just give us a call. Yep. And again, uh, just I'll close. Thank you for your time today. I know we hit you with a lot of data, but there is a lot of options out there that you can work through. And again, it's just identifying uh, the high priority ones and working through those, getting those taken care of, and then moving on to the next. Uh, we will be sending out uh, HR certificates for the CE. That will be coming out shortly. Um, and then again, if you do have questions, I'd encourage you to uh, send us an email, contact your consultant, or contact us in our general mailbox, and we'd be more than happy to uh, respond. So again, uh, the slide deck will be going out shortly, but again, appreciate everyone's time and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.